Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the next episode of the Time Horizons podcast. Today, we're super excited to be talking with Dr. Hannah Kerner, who is an assistant research professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland. Her research involves developing new machine learning methods for analyzing remote sensing data for agriculture monitoring, food security, and other, ap other applications in earth and planetary science. Dr. Kerner is the machine learning lead and US co-lead for NASA Harvest, NASA's agriculture and food security initiative run out of the University of Maryland. Welcome, Hannah. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. All right, um, so I guess we'll just get straight into it. So I think it would be useful for the audience for you to first of all, describe kind of what is it that you're doing? What is remote sensing? And then what part of like the pipeline does your work fit into? Sure, so remote sensing in general refers to data collected remotely. So um, this is usually referring to images or other types of data, spectra, for example, radar data, different um, regions of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're sensing remotely from space. So often these are satellites in Earth orbit, um, but this could also sometimes refer to aircraft that are collecting data um, at you know, varying spatial scales that we can capture in these uh, observations. And so where my work fits into this is once the data comes back from the spacecraft, um, analyzing that data to usually map some sort of property that we can use to generate products that inform some decision-making or some sort of um, actionable uh, process. Yeah, so, so basically you're using data from satellites, you're downloading that and then uh, turning that into something, some kind of useful kind of spatial data. So, so is it mostly spatial data? Is it mostly like, so the, the end product is like land use um, or like maps or like, what is the most useful kind of end product from that? Yeah, I would say the vast majority of what we're doing is what's referred to as, as an acronym of LC Luck. Uh, land cover land use change. Um, and so you might see this term a lot in like NASA websites or yeah. um, applied sciences terminology. And generally, generally what that means is turning the raw satellite data, which is very often images, into um, a map, basically. So we're creating maps that um, reveal some sort of property. So for example, a lot of what we're doing for agriculture is creating cropland or crop type maps. So we're taking these satellite data that have some spatial resolution. For example, uh, the Landsat satellites, which is kind of NASA's flagship Earth observing satellite, um, has a 30 meter per pixel resolution. So we would turn that into a prediction at a 30 meter per pixel level of some land cover or land use type. Um, in the case of cropland, this leads to a 30 meter resolution map of where all the cropland is uh, in a particular area, if that's the satellite we're using. But there are also, depending on you know, what your use case is um, and what signal you're trying to measure, um, you might use one of many different uh, Earth observing satellites like um, MODIS, for example, is closer to 250 to one 250 meters to one kilometer per pixel. So it's much coarser, but much easier from a data handling perspective. Yeah. And, you know, if you're looking at broad changes or broad land use types, MODIS might be sufficient for you. But and it also has, you know, varying temporal resolution. So MODIS has a one day revisit. So it's getting these observations basically every day. Um, compared to, again, the example of Landsat might be, would be considered medium resolution at 30 meters per pixel, um, and it has a 16-day revisit time. Sentinel-2, another one, is uh, basically ESA's version of, of a, a Landsat, which measures optical and multispectral, um, or visible and multispectral wavelengths, um, and that one is 10 meters per pixel. Um, and it has an, an approximately five day revisit time. So, um, and then, you know, we have commercial satellites that are 
increasingly coming, uh, becoming available like Planet Labs, the Dove satellites, for example, have three meter, <laughs> generally three to five meter per pixel yes, resolution. That's, that's a lot, yeah. a lot more fine grained mm -hmm. detail, I guess. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I guess I'm I'm interested in kind of just from starting quite broad here, like what does the general pipeline right now look like? So you get this data from these satellite providers. Obviously, you're involved with NASA, but there's other other players like ESA and as you mentioned, commercial players. So is it like they publish data on their websites and then you use it, or is it more like you have to I guess buy data from these providers? Or is it like more of a continuous pipeline where like you're making a pipeline and then it's like some kind of workflow of doing the processing and then putting out like, what does that look like? And then who is using those end products as well um, that mm -hmm. of like these maps that you're making? Yeah, so the, the source of the data or how you access the data kind of varies based on the provider. Um, for these NASA or ESA, um, satellites, these are generally public access programs. So anybody can access these data sets for free. Um, you know, it's a different story of whether you know how to open a GeoTIFF and display it <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, these are, they're publicly accessible. You might access them through like HTTPS or, yeah. um, you know, there might be, there are other providers that create data APIs. Um, and those are free, but um, Planet, again, for example, um, is a, a commercial satellite. So you basically purchase a license um, and then you access the data through their API with your API key. Um, and so, you know, you kind of collect the data from these various sources. There's a step of pre-processing everything, which is probably where we spend really the most of our time, unfortunately. Yeah. Clouds yeah. are a nightmare. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just removing the clouds, resampling everything to be kind of a standard resolution, both temporally and spatially and sometimes spectrally. You know, you kind of have all these steps involved to get these data machine learning ready um, and, and cleaned up. Um, and then, you know, once we apply whatever machine learning pipeline we're doing um, or do other analyses, depending on uh, other use cases, then, you know, we have this end product, which is usually a map. And so um, these maps either are used through like internal programs, like there are people who were directly providing them to for some decision making. Um, or uh, we're publishing them on, on sites where people can access them. Like uh, we have a platform that we run at, at Harvest called uh, GLAM, the Global Agricultural Monitoring System. And so there we have different maps that people can use, um, usually agricultural economists and um, kind of policy type people to look at what crop conditions are like, for example, based on a map of the cropland. Um, it's kind of like a filter, you know, you mask out only the areas you're interested in based on these, um, these map outputs, or um, we could also publish them on uh, public repositories like Zenodo or GitHub um, or Google Earth Engine. It's very common to put um, apps or uh, resulting maps as an asset in Google Earth Engine that people can then use for other uh, downstream analysis. For sure. And I wanted to just um, dig into the, it sounds like pre-processing is like a, a, a bit of a problem in like the speed, I guess, of getting models deployed fast. And what work is being done to sort of, I guess, accelerate the, the pre-processing of cloud removal or whatever other bottlenecks there are in, in that process? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that part is, you know, we spend so much time in that area of the pipeline before we get to the real fun of um, doing the machine learning. Uh, so there are like some efforts that are trying to um, sort of do some of this effort by creating more like fusion type products or what's sometimes called like virtual constellations or things like that, where they're trying to already make the data more interoperable with other constellations. Cause a lot of times we're not only using one source. Like we're not only using Sentinel or only using planet data. Um, 
we're trying to combine a bunch of different sources that can, you know, tell us different things about what we're seeing on the surface. Um, for example, it's really common to combine like optical data with synthetic aperture radar, SAR data um, from the Central One satellite, for example. Um, and so there, there, there's a big push right now for creating these fusion products, such as um, the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 data set, um, I think was just released globally. Um, but that's been a big effort by NASA to basically match those up so you can effectively treat them as the same data source rather than having to do all of this effort uh, to combine them yourself. And then they have like shared cloud masks and all this kind of stuff. Um, Planet is also working on a product where they're uh, fusing their data with uh, HLS, with Harmonized Landsat and Sentinel-2, so that then you can, you know, their data will be more interoperable with other sources so that, for example, if you have, you know, a time series of observations that might be sparse with only a single satellite, if you combine all three or however many you can get access to, you might have like a much more dense um, time series of, of what you're looking at to uh, help better identify the features you're looking for in the data. Right. And it, I also was just wondering, like, it, so now that we, I guess, from the pre-processing, once you, or even before that, how is data labeled and what are the limitations in, uh, in data labeling right now? Um, and like, is that a, or even is that a problem in, in this space? Do you mean labeling in terms of like, this is a crop. This is yeah. a forest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is really like you're on your own. You know, there's definitely, really? there's very few, uh, I, I mean, there is certainly a push for that right now to have more like community driven um, labeling efforts and uh, public data, uh, public data sets, benchmark data sets um, for remote sensing data. But one of the big challenges is that, you know, you, you can often, you could usually tell if something is cropland versus like a building or a road or a forest or these kind of broad land cover types. You can often tell that from looking at the satellite image. Um, but a lot of things that we're doing, you need, you, you can't see it in a satellite image. You know, you have to get a ground reference label. So right. we have to literally send people out in the field, you know, to say like, this is a pine tree <laughs> or like this right here, we're growing maize. <laughs> and, um, and then we use that, you know, to combine with the satellite images and try to, um, to find these patterns that we can use for classification, for example. Um, there are some data sets like SpaceNet is a popular one um, that's kind of come out in recent years to do image level classification um, of different land cover types. Radiant Earth Foundation um, is really dedicated to creating these public benchmark data sets. Um, and they have a big focus on agriculture too. Um, Lacuna Fund is also a recent um, fund that was created. It's funded by like Rockefeller Foundation, Google.org, some other partners um, to create public data sets, uh, labeled data sets for agriculture, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, because if we have data problems in the US or Europe, big data problems for labeling in Africa, you know, because there's just like so much focus on, on, on the US. And so we, we have major sparse data sets and, and limited access to data for what we're working on in Africa. For sure. And um, so when you comment on, you know, you have to have people on the ground, like actually like identifying what, like the different types of um, whatever uh, agriculture you're looking at, what, like how much of a barrier is that? Like, how do you, I guess, coordinate people to surveying, I would assume it's farmers, to then um, do that in a way that, I guess, making sure you're abiding by ethical standards and whatever types of privacy considerations um, must be at play here with that as well. Yeah, I mean, the answer to that question is still being determined. You know, this is, um, traditionally, people conduct these field surveys where 
you know, you'll go out like in the beginning of the growing season or in the middle of the growing season, a research team usually like will grow, go out, have some sampling uh, data set or some sam set of sample locations that they've drawn. Um, and then they just literally go like drive to each one and take a measurement um, and this does not scale, you know, and it definitely yeah, that, doesn't That's scale. crazy because like machine learning people traditionally complain about, oh, we have to label the images and all the data is there in the image. But this problem set, like you actually have to go and drive around. Yeah. Like it's a completely different scale. Yeah. And add, add to that, <laughs> that you might have a global pandemic and you can't go into the field. And also, you know, a lot of regions that we want to serve are remote. Um, and, and not very accessible to these types of surveys or there's conflict happening. Like for example, we're working in Mali um, to help with USAID and, and the government there to um, assess like new agricultural interventions and practices that will help boost productivity there. But, you know, to me, demanding that we get thousands and thousands of samples in a conflict region and put people in danger so that we can train a neural network and <laughs> instead of having to like actually create methods that work for the data you know to me this is like unethical <laughs> and you know we need to find ways to create machine learning methods that actually work for um for the data that we have access to not force these <laughs> real world scenarios to, to fit those um so anyway on on that topic like we're we're working on a lot of new ways to kind of transform the way that we collect field data um, to really have much more scalable and large data sets that have good spatial coverage, um, but also temporal coverage. Because by the way, the labels can change <laughs> from year to year, you know, somebody's not always planting maize. Right. And I, I, I was reading through one of your papers about the uh, a baseline for, you know, new Kenya smallholder data set and how um, Radiant ML is trying to serve as a, a benchmark data set I'm, from what I was understanding as well. And the, one of the key limitations was that you didn't have, I guess, supporting data, for example, survey dates, planting dates, rainfall, temperature. How does this now affect the um, explainability or interpretability of the data for people who might not be, or who are just using this data from, you know, who aren't necessarily the ones curating this data set and the ones who are, um, yeah, high level interpretability and explainability? Yeah, I think, you know, if we're trying to create data sets like benchmark data sets that can kind of be used off the shelf by people who, who don't know anything about agriculture, but are trying to, you know, like a lot of machine learning engineers or computer scientists that want to get involved with this field. It's really hard to think of how you can create any truly benchmark off the shelf data set for agriculture, you know, especially agriculture in smallholder dominated regions where we have all of these issues like intercropping and, and I shouldn't even say issues because you know a, a lot of these things do make this farming more resilient than like a monocropping system for example you know like these are not things that we necessarily want to change about it to make it easier for us to detect it. You know, sometimes I see pictures of the field and I'm like oh my god this is my nightmare. It's just like three crops mixed around yeah. in the field there's like a tree in the middle you know but these are things having trees in the fields help them retain like soil um retain the soil and retain different you know minerals or helpful things in the soil but so i don't want to be like can you take those trees out so it's easier for me to detect these so, so actually i have a question on that like so, so apologies if this question is a bit naive but um like i know in in robotics a lot of the time, it's very difficult to get a, a good set of data to train a machine learning algorithm just based on like data from a real robot. And so you basically go into like a simulated environment, right? And you simulate it like physics engine and you can run thousands of these things in parallel. And it's a lot che cheaper and easier than running 2000 physical robots. So is there an equivalent to that in the agricultural space or, or is it just simply too difficult to simulate that kind of thing or be able to simulate the images that would be generated and then be able to kind of you know back into the labels if that makes sense because you know what you're generating yeah in a lot of scientific domains where people are applying machine learning right now I, th I think a lot of people are looking to simulation data or synthetic data sources 
to um, augment the noisy and or yeah. sparse real world observations that that they're getting for agriculture you know there are like um, agro climate whatever models that people yeah. have traditionally used and that you know model crop growth or water dynamics or energy transport yeah. like all these different kinds of things um I think in practice for agriculture, there just tends to be so much um, variation in farming practices and climate. Like there's so many variables that are kind of making um, uh, just like a huge space of um, variations in what you would actually observe. Right. Um, and so I think that's been kind of the limiting factor there is a lot of interest now. Um, Radiant Earth, for example, uh, is working on a, a research project right now to try to create um, synthetic training data from GANs. Um, yeah. So basically to generate yeah. like specific signatures of, um, of a crop, for example, um, or generate uh, synthetic satellite data to train on. But it's, it's really challenging. And I think, you know, extrapolating that into real world settings that you trust enough to to help inform policy making that's yeah. you know a, i think a big jump still yeah and i was also just like at least in the healthcare setting i know gans and synthetic data are just not robust they they uh specifically when you look at uh minority populations or minority subgroups I, i'm just curious to know is that something that's a limitation as well as in agriculture you have these subgroup uh, populations, whether that's by geography, that these synthetic data sets just don't, oh, sorry, my, uh, my, sorry, my audio cut out there, but yeah, just don't, don't help with, like, for example, are these, like, you know, the distribution, are these disparate communities getting hidden in the tails of these distributions that these GANs just can't characterize, and therefore, uh, create more bias towards maybe these different geographies? Yeah, I think that would, definitely be a concern. I think um, it's just so early in the development of things like this. Like th that work that I just mentioned is the only one I know of <laughs> that's trying to do this, you know, and, and they're kind of still at the stage of like, can we create realistic looking satellite images that are not just RGB, but, you know, also generate the different temp or the different um, spatial resolutions and spectral information reliably um, through like all, you know, 12 bands of an image, um, spectral bands of an image. And then there's this whole question of, okay, well now for this to really be useful if we're trying to create synthetic images of, of crops in certain settings, you know, you almost need to like um, do this kind of like injection of, of the activations of the features that you want in the generated image, right? So this is, you know, <laughs> I think it's just totally, um, totally in the beginning stage right now. Um, and so, yeah, doing synthetic data versus trying to more like passively collect data in field, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different approaches that people are working on to try to, to increase the, the labeled data. For sure. And I guess more, uh, I guess like this is more of a high level question, but like, why does, why does crop type mapping matter? Like what, what, why is that important for people to care about and what, I guess, downstream impact can that have? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of important in two dimensions for a lot of the projects we're working on are for like food security enhancement or, or bolstering, but then also for um, economic reasons for commodities markets to have um, accurate information. And so for, for any of these use cases where you're trying to do any sort of decision making or evaluation related to agriculture, you're kind of asking a, a core set of questions, which is like, how much crops are there? How are they doing? Um, like, so that's area, basically crop area, and then that's crop conditions. And then you're asking like, what's the yield expected to be? So like, how efficiently are these crops yeah. going to produce? And then there's production at the end, which is basically area times yield, right? It's like a rate times an area. Yeah. And, um, and that's kind of usually what you want to know for any of these purposes. And 
the first step for doing any of that is where are the crops? <laughs> and, you know, where's the crop go growing and what type of crop is growing? And that's what the cropland mask and the crop type masks give you. And how sensitive is that window of like uncertainty in, uh, you know, planting delays or let's say a natural disaster and how much, if you're able to help, I guess, um, you know, uh, whatever, inform a, a government or whoever it is that you're working with about maybe mitigating that uncertainty, how much does that help downstream uh, as well with, with their response efforts? Yeah, I think, you know, being able to deliver information really rapidly um, is, is the effect of that really depends on the use case, you know, so like it could mean that in an in insurance use case, you know, if you can really quickly assess fields that were damaged or the level of damage, um, or even just like assess the, the yield or production of a field, um, from the satellite data, you know, you can potentially get this information um, for resolving these insurance claims much more quickly. And so it could mean that a farmer is getting a payout from their insurance claim, you know, potentially months earlier than they normally would, um, you know, depending on what region you're in. Um, and for, I think for a lot of national level decision making and, and kind of food security efforts, is a difference between having the data and not having the data, you know, and it's like there or it's not. And so, you know, it, it can really help to unlock a lot of capabilities, not so much just like improve what people are doing, but make it possible at all um, to, to do these sort of initiatives for enhancing um, uh, food security. So also, I guess, from a high level perspective, what are the what is kind of a solved problem in this space versus what is kind of open? So it sounded like from what you were talking about earlier, um, that it's, it seems like these kind of edge cases of, you know, somewhere in Africa, which has like got a very different type of land use than say in the US where maybe there's more data. Is that kind of the main breakdown or how do you see that kind of line being, where's the progress we had versus where's the, yeah. Yeah, I think like in many things, it's geographically disparate and, you know, unequal. So there's, there are soft problems in the U.S., you know, because we have these massive uniform fields um, where, you know, mapping where the cropland is in the United States is not difficult. It is, it's very much a solved problem. Um, however, mapping where the cropland is in Togo, for example, um, which we, we did during the pandemic and kind of earlier last year and published a paper about that as well. Not a solved problem. Um, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of these signals are kind of below the resolution of typical remote sensing satellites or, or that spatial resolution. You know, a field um, in Togo is, you know, usually way less than um, one hectare, half of a hectare. You know, this might be like, 20 meters wide, for example, right. whereas in the US, it's like hundreds of kilometers, you know, it's just a completely yeah. different scale. Um, and so, you know, what's what's a solved problem in one place is not a solved problem in the other. And, and that's really due to like low data. You know, we know how in machine learning, like we know how to um, take, you know, thousands of clean labels of something and yeah. train a model to, to make some predictions and find a decision boundary, you know we're not so good at like dealing with really sparse data with high inter um, high interclass variants, low interclass variants, multi-label classifications, still challenging, you know? And so a lot of the methods that we're employing for these kinds of problems are more like um, using approaches like meta learning or looking at few shot learning, kind of these areas where, um, it's sort of less obvious. Like for, for us, something that gets like a 0.2% increase in ImageNet is not going to like really <laughs> translate to benefit, you know? Um, and, and so that's really not like, it, it's hard because you'll see these papers published and you're like, wow, that's super cool. Like this NERVS paper, 
um, you know, I wonder if this would work for us. And then you're like, oh, what was the actual benefit? Okay, never mind. Yeah. Like, who even knows? You know, it's just it's such yeah. a different. Um, so, so actually, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. Just picking up on that kind of, I guess, bridging the, I guess, second topic that we we're going to talk about, which is um, just saying in the the first topic for a second though, um, to what extent are algorithmic improvements in in kind of the algorithms that you're using to do this kind of classification, creating these land use maps. Is it algorithmic improvements or is it literally like you just need more labels? Like is you saying like a, a GAN versus, um, you know, an LSTM versus any of these other techniques. Is that where the improvement is to be had? Or yeah, as I said, is it literally labeling? Mm -hmm. I think the assumption is that it's the data and there's like a huge community focus on we need to get more labels like we need you know we're trying to make this real world data it's like people are saying the ml models are not working for real world data we need to change the data yeah it's like no <laughs> you know we this is the real world you know like this is the data that's there yeah. and sure like we can improve the way we collect it like you know, you can make sure the camera's oriented a certain way. Like we can try to, to help it out a yeah. little bit. We can try to clean it up for sure. But, you know, the answer is not like change the farming practices or like create a world that's not a world of data that's not representative of the real world. Like we're not trying to move our, in my opinion, we shouldn't be trying to move our real world data sets to like a benchmark representation yeah. that has like yeah. neatly defined class boundaries yeah uh, huh so that that's really interesting so you, you're saying that like the algorithm right now it's kind of i think that the machine learning community seems to think that if they you know just do well enough on ImageNet, that um that you know the the world the world's problems will be solved in some way i don't know like that seems to be kind of some <laughs> underlying assumption um that is a bit unspoken but then kind of on the other hand you're saying that some people on on, on like the kind of more pragmatic side um, think, oh, we just need to change the data and make it um, good enough that it can work with these kind of existing techniques. But what you're saying is that we really need to be think, thinking of it as a whole system. So you need to br bring those models into a format that is able to deal with this kind of messy data. Exactly. I think the, I think the underlying assumption in the machine learning community is that if it works great for benchmark data sets, it's a trivial extension to yeah. the real world and so that's why like applications is a dirty word in you know <laughs> in your papers and your reviews it's almost like you know this is why I wrote that <laughs> MIT <laughs> article it's just that like years and years of you know getting reviews that are like this is really fascinating and awesome, but it's an application. It's like, how does that somehow invalidate what you're doing? And having these same conversations with people working on real world problems who are saying the exact same thing. And yet, like, that's just the world we live in, you know, and, and we know that it's not just simply a case of like, making the, the data fit nicely to go into the algorithm yeah. and boom, you're done, you know, but but then I think in the application, like in the domain setting too, or in the um, the domain experts also, you know, either have been led to or on their own think that if they just make their data work for machine learning, then that will solve all their problems too. And yeah. it's I, I think, you know, it's not all the case. And I think something like um, the pulse algorithm is, is a great example of this where um, I loved this example in Charles Isbell's keynote at NeurIPS recently. I don't know if you guys um, saw this talk, but basically they were talking about um, Pulse, which is built on top of StyleGAN, which um, is, is basically uh, generating high resolution faces from downsampled or like compressed low res pixelated images of faces. And it was really controversial because it completely fails on black faces and also fails on mixed race faces or oh you know, yes i think i did see this yeah. yeah yeah it was like not just turning obama into a white obama but just like a completely different person with like generally maybe like the correct shape of the face and you know what are you supposed to do in that setting say like oh well change the data you know like what do you 
what is that useful for in a real yeah. world setting? Like, oh, you can only use this with white people. Like, what's the response there? And um, Cynthia Rudin's point in, in this talk was that uh, from Duke University, her point was that this is not the data. This is actually, you know, they've tried to fix this, but it's a problem with style GAN. That style GAN does not work well with generating from features that are space far apart in the lane space, which yeah. is the case for a lot of faces. Yeah. And so to me, I'm like, you know, this is an algorithmic issue. This is not something that the data can be fixed to do. And I think, you know, this is really the case with a lot of real world things where, you know, we have Siri, but what else? <laughs> yeah. And it, I, I think that even comes back to like Timnit, Gebru and Joy B's paper on gender shades. Like even when you balance and have a properly curated data set, uh, it does not improve downstream classification or performance on minority subgroups. And like, yeah, I guess, what do you think is incentivizing this community of people though, to continue to go for these 0.02% incremental gains and not go to the applied space? If we know that the applied space can yield, like, I guess, general impact on people. I think it's just this general like culture almost in, in the machine learning community that says that applications are kind of easy, that like, you know, the, the real work or like the um, prestigious work is in doing foundational ML development. And so that leads to like creating these, you know, very interesting experiments or uh, methods or approaches that are using benchmark data because you know usually to show something from a foundational perspective you do need benchmark data sets or you need synthetic data sets because you know you're trying to show a very specific thing but when the applications are not valued and the um you know the the benefits to the foundational ml are not valued from from the applications this leads to like an automatic rejection of um, of applications work in reviewing. You know, it's it's mainly I think something that needs to change in in the priorities of peer reviewing in these ML conferences. Um, and you know, we have an increasing number of, of workshops on on applications that are also peer reviewed, but it's not in the main track, and it doesn't get the same amount of attention. Yeah. And, and do you think bibliometrics has a play in this as well of like, I want to, to create a paper that's going to just get cited and therefore I could get more funding for my research. And like, how does that come into play now with regards to like, I want to make an impact on the world versus I want to get funding from my lab to like continue making incremental gains on whatever it is. Yeah, you know, I think what's interesting is that like funding, a lot of the funding is actually an interdisciplinary work. <laughs> like NSF, NASA, all of these people like want to see yeah. people working on interdisciplinary teams doing th like this real world impact work. But the conferences and, you know, again, your citation factor, which is driven largely by, you know, which of these conferences you get into, um, you know, that's what's really saying like what we value is like very foundational work um, and if you so much as say, you know, it's like a kind of a, a sad joke <laughs> almost within a lot of a lot of people I work with that are also working on um, ML applications that like you have to find if you want to get published in a computer science or a machine learning, you know, top tier conference, you need to find a way to present your work as if it's not an application. You know, you may be working on yeah. this application, but you need to frame it in a way that preferably doesn't mention the application at all, but if you have to <laughs> also shows it on an- ML It's a footnote, page. yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, oh, and like, <laughs> we did it, but it's almost By dangerous to even yeah. mention it. Yeah, I mean, it really not just feels that way, but I think the, the review evidence shows that it's the case. Yeah, that's interesting. So it seems like it's, it's, it's really being driven by, um, if, if you want to get cited, your work has to be useful in different like areas, but the, like, but the only way that it's going to be accepted like as kind of a general insight is if it's, if it's you know, something that's pure 
whatever that means like oh your result works on image net but not necessarily on real data yeah that's really right right and i actually wonder this about the medical domain maybe you guys know or medical applications because to me it seems that like medical applications is almost accepted as like its own branch of machine learning. Um, and there's a huge number of like faculty positions that are solicited to work on medical applications. And to me, that seems like sort of much more accepted in the mainstream. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you think that. Yeah, I, I think like, I think that is true. I think it it, it is more like the theory in the medical space, at least in, my, in our lab is not as theory, it's more applied. Uh, in general as well. But there is also a focus in the clinical space of data curation and co collection as well. That seems like it's also not agnostic to just, you know, uh, to healthcare. But yeah, I think it, it is very interesting because it, it seems like it's a frustrating problem as well. It's like, I'm trying to make an impact, but the incentives in this community don't support impact. They support this like orthogonal, like, I guess, whatever research domain. Uh, how do we then make progress in the in the space like what does progress look like in the future with respect to, to machine learning and how do we actually get a community of people who arguably are some of the most talented people in the world to solve the most pressing problems like yeah you know. i mean i i think we're all looking for the answer yeah. to that yeah but, you know i think like having more interdisciplinary teams that are showing like the real impact that you can actually have is you know one way to do that but i think also having thought leadership in this on this topic and having you know current leaders of the machine learning community also kind of um speak up about this and and make this priority you know i think people respond to that and charles isbell's keynote at, at nerifs i think was um it really validating <laughs> to, to listen to. Um, and, and I hope that more um, conversations like that will happen. And, and yeah, how do you note it? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So perhaps, perhaps like it really is um, a, it, it really is kind of like this problem of between fields, because I know, for example, in the, in the robotics space as well, which is kind of another application in some sense of a lot of the machine learning stuff there is um like there definitely is kind of an exchange with the like both like the reinforcement learning community from the perspective of kind of control algorithms as well as computer vision community from the perspective of, of perception there definitely is that um exchange and um like people in like people do definitely publish application papers for robotics um, but there definitely is kind of a split between people who are like doing more kind of pure ML versus people who are really doing robotic stuff. Um, so I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe it is really just a cultural thing of people need to be willing to read more broadly than just, oh, I'm only a machine learning researcher and I only read pure machine learning papers and on either like synthetic data sets or accepted, you know, benchmark data sets. Yeah, that's really interesting. Right. And I mean, you can't blame people because, you know, they're also optimizing their own objective. Function. Yeah, for sure. But the problem is that like that objective for the community, I think needs to change. And, and do you think that um, like having the University of Maryland as well as NASA has helped you drive that interdisciplinary collaboration to making uh, an impact and like how can other researchers maybe try to strive for something if that has been helpful and how does do you think other researchers should strive for something like that as well? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the work I'm doing would not at all be possible if I was not, not just like collaborating with domain experts, but embedded in them, you know, like, like I've worked on a couple of different applications, you know, before, I mean, I still work a, lo a lot on uh, planetary exploration or the Mars Rover data and, um, you know, totally non-Earth applications and, you know, other- You're not driving to a field on Mars to get labels. No. <laughs> yeah, despite what Elon Musk wants you to think. But, um, yeah, and, and so I'll never forget this one time um, during my PhD when I was like in the early stages of working on what eventually was basically my dissertation of creating novelty detection methods for- 
identifying novel geologic features and in Mars rover multispectral images. And I was like, you know, everything is orange, basically. Like everything is just a dust covered rock to my eye. And I'm like looking at these, these predictions by the model and I'm like, oh man, like this isn't interesting at all. This didn't find anything good. And my lab mate walked by and she's like, oh, that's this one thing. Like, did it find that? And I was like, what? This is interesting to you? You know, and it's just like this layer of rock that she had studied and like knew about the multispectral like slopes of between bands. And I never, ever would have been able to figure that out. And, you know, just too much literature to try to understand a, a completely other field and mm-hmm. you know be able to make progress as a as a computer scientist like you you have to be working with them early on from the beginning to be able to uh, like build the right thing you know we don't want to build a system and be like here you go I built this model and they're like okay this doesn't work with any real data like a lot of times I think what happens is people just you know, computer scientists will try to find the cleanest possible data set. If it doesn't exist, force it to be like super clean and well posed for the problem that they want to work on. But then when they deliver that for the real world, people are like, what is this? What am I going to, this doesn't work for me, (laughs) you know? And, and it's impossible, I think, to, to build effective solutions without having like truly interdisciplinary teams. For sure. And I know you commented on earlier how getting maps in the U.S. is is not is not as nearly as difficult as it is in sub-Saharan Africa. But how do you, as a researcher, also as collaborating with these other organizations, have in your project pipeline some type of empowerment with local uh, scientists in those areas to also being able to to drive this such that maybe they aren't dependent on international organizations for data curation, collection and deployment, and they are able to, to develop their own you know, public data sets that we can access here without too much investment there. Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of what we work on is not just creating these methods that we can kind of give the maps to or even give the models to, but like build help build up capacity in the region for one consuming that information because if you're creating a map but there's like nobody who understands remote remote sensing or what that map means or how to interpret it or what the caveats are you know it's not very useful so there's that side of things but you know we also want to help build up the technical capacity which is there you know the talent is definitely there um and so what we don't want to be doing is taking all this data getting all this money and grants, (laughs) publishing on it. You know, this um, with our Africa lead, Catherine Nakulembe, who's also a professor at uh, UMD with me. She, um, she's based in Uganda. And what we talk about a lot is like data colonialism, you know, and how a lot of people are just trying to take this data and benefit from the publications and mm. the accolades and in the media and oh, the get the pat on the back yeah. for publishing something about Africa, but then exactly. you, you're not actually you know, engaging with them. It's like white saviorism, <laughs> you know, in, <laughs> in research and and what you know we're really trying to do is create that capacity there and create you know, not just interdisciplinary teams, but international teams um, that are sustaining these efforts. And yeah, and I know that there is some work, I know I'm familiar with like the deep learning in DABA mentorship team that tries to engage researchers uh, from North America to support and mentor researchers in sub-Saharan Africa. But I was also just curious to know, like, what does, what does building capacity look like to you? Does that mean engaging a scientist during the process? Like, what does, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, I think it means a lot of different things. For one thing that we do a lot is engaging, like training and engaging local individuals as field agents for data collection. Um, and so they become kind of experts in this skill that they can then, you know, use in many other applications. Um, but it also means, you know, collaborating with actual teams on method development or um, bringing in people who work with our team the whole time, whether that's like a PhD student or, you know, a graduate student in the country we're working in, 
or maybe it's somebody within the government that we're working with throughout the entire time. There's a lot of like trainings that go on of, of how to, um, you know, create the data that goes into these pipelines, but also then interpret it. Um, it's a lot of different things. And, um, you know, we're, I think another great example of this is um, with the Lacuna Fund that I mentioned earlier, where um, there were a lot of people who wanted to apply for this from the US, but we specifically had this required, not just the US and Europe, everywhere, you know, it was uh, got a lot of attention, but we specifically had this requirement that um, the, the submitting organization had to be headquartered in Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> and so this disqualified a lot of people who, who <laughs> would otherwise be like, wait, <laughs> I want this. Uh, but it was, it, you know, that we did that requirement for a reason because we wanted the data to be owned by them um, and to be hosted by them and, you know, for others to benefit from this public resource, but, you know, um, for it to like to create ownership there and also help to fund additional capacity for building up those efforts, right? Because now that money goes to pay graduate students, faculty, staff, engineers um, at several different institutions. For sure. And I, 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 am, I do love the work of the Lacuna Fund because some of the work that, um, that we're doing in clinical ML is how can we make clinical machine learning more generalizable? And so that means finding ways to curate data from other places. And I do wonder though, like, let's say hypothetically in, a, in an ideal world, the Lacuna Fund and these other organizations do get data and it is labeled. Um, we still know that like just having a labeled data set may not solve the, the problem as well. So it's like, it's how do we then also think forward beyond that? Um, yeah, it, it, it seems like a very challenging problem in healthcare. I, I'd, I'd imagine that it, is it also something you think about in, in the agriculture space? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to what you asked earlier about like how, you know, how does that affect, how does a benchmark data set that's out there in public affect how people are using it? Um, or, or, you know, what are they not seeing basically? And I think, you know, that's, that's still going to be a challenge, um, but we have to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the empowerment and the, and the just engaging these, the local uh, community is, is such a challenging task as well because you don't want to have these Harvard MIT researchers having first name authors uh, and then these middle authors from sub-Saharan Africa when they should be driving you know and supporting and we're, we're like not necessarily us but you know them are supporting them and building that capacity um, mm -hmm. and the incentives here just don't don't support that <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, even like having grants come to your institution, like a University of Maryland, you know, they take out a big chunk of money to go towards building up that institution, right? There's all this yep. overhead. Like there are so many benefits of receiving the grant money as a primary institution um, that, you know, get just completely overlooked or passed over for saying, okay, the money's gonna come here. To UMD, for example, but we're going to, you know, we're going to have collaborators at Macquarie University, you know what I mean? Right. It's a completely different benefit. Um, and, and so, you know, like many issues in, in the world right now and in the United States, you know, I think as researchers, we really need to think about how we're contributing to these structural um, issues. Yeah, and so I guess kind of um, going to some kind of uh, more, not personal questions, but kind of focus on you. Um, you you're obviously, you, you do all these different initiatives, both in the kind of research community, as well as these more applied things with NASA. What, like, what is it about you that makes you kind of able to, like, what are you really good at that is, enables you to do this um, kind of cross-disciplinary work? Yeah, I, I think I've found that- Don't I'm feel ob obliged to be too modest either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've found that I'm pretty good at quickly learning about somebody else's expertise and, you know, definitely not nearly becoming their level of expert in it, but being able to place that in like a generalized framework of knowledge in my brain that I can kind of you know, map onto new fields 
um, to be able to figure out, you know, what information I need to know or what questions to ask to, um, to create machine learning applications for that uh, particular domain. And so I think that's what's enabled me to really work on a lot of different topics um, using machine learning, you know, because to me, I'm like, it's all tensors, right? <laughs> in, in some way, like these are, are represented yeah. and these data can be represented in some, uh, in some way that we can map this understanding onto. For sure. Yeah. And I, uh, I we were, we were also just curious for like some like quick hitter type questions of like, what are some, what are some of the best ways you found to, to learn? Like, uh, like what, whether that be for research or just general education, what are the best habits for learning that you've found helpful for you or for students that you mentor or teach or advise as well? Um, I think, you know, not being, uh too specific about what you think is the right thing to learn at a given time you know i think thinking back to when i was in college you know there would always be some class or something that you're hearing from somebody or even now you know you'll go to a conference and see different things but just like not being too specific about what you think the trajectory of your learning and knowledge and and progress needs to be because I, to me i find that like everything I learn about kind of like gets connected in some way, you know, you, you find some insight from something that seems totally unrelated, which is, I think I love to read um, both fiction, fiction and nonfiction. And to me, like, maybe that's what helps to, to form these mental structures of, you know, organizing information and connections and stories. And, and to me, you know, it's very similar, you know, thinking about um, what other people are doing. And, you know, I, I think anything can be made to seem fascinating by somebody who's passionate about it. And so, you know, learning from people, surrounding yourself by people who are really passionate about what they do makes it easy mm -hmm. to learn from them. <laughs> yeah. What, what books are you said you, uh, you read a lot of fiction and nonfiction. What books, I guess, in both those categories would you most highly recommend to both us and people who are listening? Yeah, um, I read a book in the last like two years uh, in the fiction category called uh, All the Light We Cannot See, which now has kind of become the standard <laughs> for books to me. I'm like, that was five stars. So this new one that I'm reading, two stars. <laughs> You know, like, is it anywhere close? You know, it was just, that was a really great book to me. Um, and then um, I think in the nonfiction world, uh, I've really enjoyed reading Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, who actually, like, if you're not a big reader, has a new, um, I don't remember which streaming thing it's on, but has basically like a, a live reading of a bunch of ex excerpts from uh, his book Between the World and Me. Um, but I really loved his books and he has a, a novel recently um, called The Water Dancer um, that I, I really liked as well. But I'm, I'm currently about to start reading a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport that oh, um, yes. he's a computer. Have you read this? I, I haven't read it, but I've heard, I've heard a, like, a, like every, I swear, like every month someone says, read Cal Newport. Yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I, I get books from the public library, um, which, you know, I cannot recommend enough. I, it amazes me that more people don't use the public library, but, you know, I've, I've been on hold <laughs> for this book for months yeah. and months and months. So I finally have it. And it's already overdue, so I'm just <laughs> collecting fines. But anyway, yeah, that's that's what I'm excited to read now. Yeah, and it sounds like also reading fiction, nonfiction, getting breadth in other areas, not necessarily just related to the same thing that your, I guess, your professional career is also focused in is probably seems like it's helped you. What is your philosophy on breadth versus depth and getting experiences maybe that aren't necessarily always related to what you do? Yeah, well, I got a PhD, so that's, that's <laughs> one, one point for depth. <laughs> but I mean, I really actually I got a PhD because I wanted the opportunity to learn something extremely deeply. Um, you know, I basically wanted like this reason <laughs> and this this focus in my life to be able to just 
you know, really dive into something. And I think that that doesn't just teach you about that topic, right? You know, learning just this process of learning to be an expert in anything, I think is, to me, it's like a brain upgrade is kind of what I thought about it as. Um, and whatever that is, just like, I think knowing something very deeply is important. But then I don't think you need to be a deep expert in everything, of course, you know, but but I think students who um, and, and programs that really focus on like breath only is really like at their peril <laughs> later <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's great to have a lot of different interests. But if you haven't really mastered one thing, I think it's hard to, um, you know, do anything. Better. Yeah. You know, where where do you go with that? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, I think we've had like a, a really good, like quick hit session here. Was there anything else that you wanted to say to the, like our listeners um, to anything else? Maybe you didn't get to cover and anything that we talked about. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe going back to this idea of like what we're all optimizing in life, you know, I think it's interesting just to think about like, what is your objective function <laughs> and like what what is your community's objective function and and for the machine learning people you know what should we be optimizing as a community not just like you know right now i feel like a lot of us are kind of optimizing our h index but <laughs> you know, and, but like you know this we live in the real world you know and, and what is the point of all of this you know I think I, I just want us all to think about that, myself included. You know, what are what are we doing this for at the end of the day? For sure, yeah. And I think it, it would be a good time for me to try to try to summarize for me to the problems that what we covered today. And if you if you think I'm maybe saying anything wrong, feel free to chime in. I think what you talked about at the end is very important, which is I think self awareness. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Uh, why is it important? I think. Um, we talked a lot at the beginning about agriculture and remote sensing and its applications uh, globally, both in high income and low income countries. Um, we talked about the limitations of it, which is labeling data, the sparsity of data, pre-processing the data, like challenges around cloud removal. Uh, we also talked about how data curation is a big problem, but we're thankful for people like the Lacuna Fund, USAID and researchers like yourself who are trying to make an effort to make it easier for locals to do that. Um, and then we also talked a bit more about research itself. What are people doing in research? Why is incremental gains what people are, seems like optimizing for and the incentives within that? And how can we maybe make people who do applied research that matters more useful in this academic community of conferences and this model that we're trying to figure out and reform? Um, and then we finally talked a bit more about some high level I guess, uh, personal level questions that we got to learn more about you, which was breadth versus depth. It seems like getting breadth and depth for you has been tremendously valuable uh, and definitely going to, uh, you know, try to check out some of the books you had. And yeah, uh, it, uh, it, was that an okay summary of the, of the conversation? Yeah, I think that was excellent. Great. Um, so thank you so much, Hannah, for uh, coming on and uh, hopefully the listeners enjoyed this.